What remains after extraction? The field of architecture is increasingly adept at tracing material flows and global supply chains, locating buildings within broader territories of extraction, entwining geology, labor, infrastructure, and finance on a planetary scale, the earth mapped through the managerial logics of resource exploitation. But those infrastructures of flow are accompanied by infrastructures of containment, infrastructures which at times are harder to see, harder to inscribe within the temporality of resource extractivism. Against the speed and the global reach of material movement are vestiges like tailing dams, sacrifice zones of long duration that enable the process of geological consumption. This is the Stanrock Tailings Wall, photographed by Robert Del Tradici near Elliott Lake in Ontario. It takes a moment to see the wall itself. The eye goes first to the dead trees in the waterlogged ground. The tailings wall does not register as an object or an infrastructure, so much as a second horizon, a long level rise of white sand. Stripped of uranium, this new geological formation reaches bribe products like radium-226 polonium-210, radon-222, decay products that remain radioactive for hundreds of thousands of years. The future of these tailings remains far, far longer than their mind past. Radium mining began in the Northwest Territories of Canada near Great Bear Lake in 1930 at the El Dorado Mine, also known as Port Radium. In 1943, El Dorado began supplying uranium for the Manhattan Project, material that traversed what Peter Van Wyck has called the Highway of the Atom as it made its way to Port Hope in Ontario for processing. Given declining outputs and the length of the uranium's journey, the development of deposits around Elliott Lake, the site of an Ojibwa village, provided a more opportune source of Cold War atomic ambition. An accessible crease of sedimentary rock from the Huronian glaciation some 2.4 billion years ago made Elliott Lake the uranium capital of the world in the mid-1950s. Resource extractivism demands material flows, but it also brings social infrastructures, a genre of urbanism that has ranged from the trading posts of early modern globalization to the so-called man camps of contemporary oil sands exploitation. Elliott Lake was organized as a ground-up settlement, described in startling terms by L. Carson Brown in a promotional brochure. One of Canada's most completely modern, wholly planned, and most thoroughly livable communities, he writes, arose phoenix-like from the ashes of two ancient cities half a world away. On the one hand, the ideal suburbanism of a 1950s company town. On the other, the genocidal bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the two were mediated by the United States' stockpiling of uranium. The town, which has since become a retirement destination, and the Tailings Dam are united in being remainders of this landscape of extraction. Del Tradici's photography offers another window into this expanded landscape. The Stan Rock Tailing Wall comes into focus alongside the industrial aftermath of uranium production and processing, with Port Hope as a particular site of ongoing contestation and remediation. Del Tradici's photography oscillates between the prohibition of the human figure in these off-limit landscapes and their presence in the persona of activists, farmers, citizens. From the company town to the networks of anti-nuclear activism, these social infrastructures are one way of bringing the tailing dam into visibility, because tailing dams typically only become visible in moments of failure. As mining waste continues to accumulate in greater quantities, and as tailing dams age with little oversight, they rupture into view at increasing rates, with the human costs typically borne by rural communities, often indigenous. Unlike the monumental dams of irrigation and electrification, tailings dams are produced with minimal expenditure, focused on containment rather than generation. If the so-called high dam was a quintessentially Cold War infrastructure, 
so is something like the Stan Rock Tailings Wall, a geological non-monument to the atomic age. What becomes of tailings? At times, they are reused. While most contemporary uranium production is too remote to imagine transforming mine tailings into resources, that hasn't always been the geography of uranium, as Elliot Lake attests. Hannah LaRue and Gabriel Hecht describe how tailings literally built radon into the walls of houses from post-colonial Gabon to the Navajo Nation. In Port Hope, high levels of radon necessitated the evacuation of St. Mary's Elementary School in 1975, another site documented by Del Tridici and others. The playground and foundations had been built on sandy fill from uranium processing in the 1950s. Sometimes tailings can be mined a second time using increasingly complex extraction techniques, but mostly they are piled or stored underwater to help block the release of radiation, where its decay products remain radioactive for tens of thousands of years, well beyond the window of regulatory oversight for most tailing facilities. Nor is uranium consigned to history. Uranium production today is only slightly below its Cold War peak of 1980, though the geography has changed. The United States, which has long been the world's largest consumer of uranium, now produces virtually none. Some 40% of the world's uranium now comes from Kazakhstan, which is one of China's principal suppliers for reactor-grade uranium. Canada's output has remained relatively level for the past 40 years, despite the low uranium prices of the 1990s and early 2000s. But that geography has changed as well. Canadian uranium is now produced only in northern Saskatchewan, deep underground where uranium is mixed with water to produce a slurry that is pumped to the surface, though it still passes through Port Hope. Coal tailings, oil tailings, uranium tailings, and now lithium tailings at each turn in the history of energy generation, landscapes are left marked by tailings dams, an ubiquitous global infrastructure that unites carboniferous, atomic, and renewable energy regimes in their need to impound their byproducts. Coming to terms with the tailings dam as a planetary network of containment, alongside their specific local effects, specific durations, and specific capacities for catastrophe, remains a crucial project for architectural research. Making the tailing dam visible as an object with an extensive geographic, temporal, environmental, and social reach likewise exceeds the architectural archive as we generally know it.